Hey folks, in this video we'll be talking about EIS transmission line fitting of a coin cell battery under blocking conditions. This video is based off of one of our advanced EIS webinars developed by my colleague Dr. Neil Spinner. This video is broken up into several sections. We'll first talk about the electrochemical system, in this case a coin cell battery, and what defines a blocking condition. We'll then talk about modeling that coin cell battery using a transmission line. We will then perform a circuit fit, and then using that circuit fit data, we will calculate the tortuosity of the system. Timestamps can be found in the description below. Now, before we begin, please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Uh, a coin cell. Uh, of course, again, same kind of disclaimer. I don't have all of the, the information about uh, the physical system, but from what I can sort of assume, a coin cell usually consists of like a metal case and a cap, usually some kind of a compression spring and a gasket to um, press all of the items inside together. Um, in this case, the person used um, an identical NMC111 electrode on both sides. So the anode and cathode essentially being identical. I believe this um, is a, a nickel manganese cobalt oxide, something like that, um, which is typically used as like a lithium ion battery electrode. And then they used, uh, I believe, like a glass fiber carbon separator. Their electrolyte was a half molar TBA CLO4 in a uh, mixture of ethylene carbonate, dimethyl carbonate. So this is basically like a lithium ion battery electrolyte, except you'll notice there's no lithium ions. There's no LiPF6 or anything like that. And so this is an interesting setup because we have identical electrodes, electrolyte with no faradaic species. And so normally what you would be studying is something like charging, discharging, intercalation, deintercalation, um, these kinds of processes, but there's none of that because there's no Faradaic species. So the reason why people do this is because this is what is called a blocking setup or a blocking condition, blocking boundaries, um, reflecting boundaries, um, open boundaries. These are all similar kinds of terms that are used for this type of system. Uh, and the reason you're doing this is because it allows you to study um, the microstructure of your electrode and specifically porous microstructure. So this works particularly well for porous electrodes. Um, and uh, and, and the, the lack of um, Faradaic species allows you to sort of isolate probing of those porous microstructure features. And so the main points or questions from this person was that how can their data be fit using what's called the transmission line model? And my follow-up to that is about how we might calculate um, the property of tortuosity from the specifically the open transmission line model. And so I'll, I'm going to cover that now. So if I look at this electrode and I zoom in on a microscopic image, what you typically will see for an electrode that can be studied this way is something that looks like cracked earth or dry, dried out dirt or so, something like that, where you have, you know, parts of, of, of the electrode and then cracks or fissures. So this is where the porous microstructure comes into play. We can draw a kind of uh, a, a simplified model of, of this porous microstructure, for example, like a cross section. And we might have electrolyte here, electrode here. We might have a backing electrode, uh, either just more of the same electrode itself, or we might have like a current collector, for example, um, which, you know, in batteries is sometimes copper or aluminum, something like that. This uh, could, could be any of a number of materials, let's say. The model that we use, which is this transmission line model, um, goes like this. We have uh, a leading resistor, as we do with it, almost any model. Then we have a uh, resistance or an impedance, this X1 or R1, through the electrolyte. We have boundary conditions at the you know start or the end and the base or the you know the, the inside of the pore which might be might be different might be similar might be there might not but we we can account for those boundary conditions we can account for an interaction in the 
pore itself between the electrode and the electrolyte, which is this Y element, the boundaries being the ZA and the ZB. And then we have an impedance or a resistance through the electrode itself. And that's this X2. So this is, this is the generalized transmission line model. And where this comes from is um, from an actual transmission line. If you imagine, or uh, if you've you know, seen uh, power lines, uh, uh, electricity lines running you know, on the side of a roadway, for example, the poles being this Y element where there's many poles connecting the power lines to the earth. And then you have resistances through the power lines themselves and through the ground. And so this, this model, this is where this comes from. It's, it comes from a real, you know, representing rea a real, you know, system. The two other things that I'll just say about this model before we get to the specifics of this system, this sort of curious dot, dot, dot here, which is like an infinite sum of this Y element and these, you know, resistances. The reason for that is because um, it, it's been observed for porous electrodes that there's this distribution of current in the pore. And so um, this transmission line model is a way to try and account for like, that distribution of current, you know, non-uniform current by having sort of an infinite sum model to, to, you know, to normalize that behavior, if you will, uh, rather than just use a single element. And so that, that's where this comes from. It's, it's this current distribution modeling. Now, as it relates to this particular situation, one observation that we can make is that the conductivity of my electrode is much higher than the conductivity of the electrolyte. And this is, should be somewhat obvious, right? The metal is going to have a higher conductivity than um, even a highly concentrated electrolyte, uh, which means that the resistance or the impedance through the electrode is going to be less than that of the electrolyte. So basically what we can do is neglect this X2 or this R2, we can just say it's you know, effectively zero. And the analogous um, situation is that basically the, you know, the resistance or the impedance through the ground in this real power line system is, is basically negligible as well. The next assumption we can make, which um, again is because there's no Faradaic processes, there's no lithium ions here, is that this interface Y is effectively just capacitance. There's no charge transfer. And so the lack of charge transfer um, essentially means um, no resistor capacitor, no Randall's element. So we can just boil that down. And then finally, as I mentioned with this um, open boundary, this reflecting, this blocking boundary, um, the way that's handled is that these ZA and ZB are infinite, infinite impedance or open, right? So there's actually an open, um, you know, part of the circuit. So this, what you're looking at right here is what is sometimes referred to as an open transmission line model, okay? And so let's go take a look at the data set. And this is the kind of model that we would want to fit. We got one data set, so this will be relatively quick some easy analysis of this, we see basically just capacitance, right? Mostly a straight up and down line. So that's a good sign. We see uh, a little bit of this sort of lagging 45 degree kind of behavior here, uh, and then some diffusion. And that's uh, pretty typical of a transmission line, which um, if you do some more transmission line fitting that you'll see this kind of pattern repeat itself. Uh, in our software, we have a special transmission line circuit fit sort of all by itself. And it allows you to tinker with this generalized model. So you see, I have a resistor. I have an inductor. I can get rid of the inductor. I don't need that. I want to get rid of this X2. I'm going to have that be short. So I can get rid of that, just like I showed previously. The next thing is that this, uh, it, either one, I suppose I could do the open boundaries, ZA and ZB. I want to be open. And then this Y element to be just capacitance or just a CPE. So here's my open model. Okay, and so now I can run my circuit fit with this open model. You can see that I'm gonna need to let me see here. Run my circuit fit. And yeah, sorry, here we go. So um, 
the sorry the same sorts of fits um, uh, tricks here. So I, I've in, I've maxed out my um, CPE. So let me give that a little more space. And uh, one thing that I uh, know will help this fit as well is that you can see uh, the effect of this alpha. It just affects the slope of of this you know up and down line. So I can kind of help it out by making that um, you know line up at, at least somewhat close, and then do my final calculation. Uh, in this case, you see parametric looks all right. Uh, I can try unity. I think it will actually fit. Yeah, it kind of lines that up a little more nicely. Overall, I, I like the way this fits. When you zoom in, you see a little bit of noise, you know, perhaps a little bit um, curvature here that I'm not quite capturing. Um, and so, you know, certainly it's it's possible that you could have, you know, variation of this. Possibly my assumption of these boundaries might be incorrect. Maybe there's some capacitance required here, you know, a different capacity. Some of those could be um, tried and see how that looks, if that helps some of these. But overall, you know, macroscopically, I, I think this fit looks pretty good and it's overall capturing the kind of, um, you know, behavior that I, it appears to me is going on. Okay, so the last thing that we're going to do is talk about tortuosity and how what I just showed for the fit can lead to some mathematical quantitative analysis. So for those unfamiliar with tortuosity, which is represented with tau, um, it's essentially a transport path elongation with respect to a straight line. So if you imagine something like um, you know, a, a path in the woods, but if this is like a microstructure, um, the shortest distance is you know, a straight line D, and you can imagine a path with some other distance. Tortuosity is just the ratio of those distances. Needless to say, the smallest it can be is one based on this definition, right? That the, if the path could also go in a straight line, then the tortuosity would be one. Um, another way to think about this is that the larger the value, the more tortuous the path. And then potentially what that you know could mean in reality is that it's just more hindered diffusion. Um, Right. It, if there's a longer path length for a molecule to move between two points, you know, maybe those points are the, you know, entrance of a pore and where it's going to react, so, something like that. I mean, you know, there's, there's a lot of possibilities for the, what this means, but that might hinder diffusion and create a longer diffusional path. So one, you know, way I think you, that tortuosity is thought of is that the, the larger the value in, in, in some ways, you know, the more detrimental it might be to that um, catalyst behavior. Practically calculating it involves this uh, dimensionless quantity called the McMullen number. Um, this method, by the way, is described in this paper that I've shown down here by Landesfeind. It's in the uh, Huber Gastiker group um, in Germany, who they do terrific work. Um, I, I encourage you to, to look up this paper if this um, is of interest to you. They, they describe this whole process. I'm basically taking it from their uh, reference. Um, but but essentially the ratio of tortuosity and porosity, which is another right, uh, just intrinsic property of a material, is equal to this expression here. So this is where the circuit fit comes into play. We have an impedance or resistance um, involved here. We also have a surface area, conductivity, and a thickness. Um, and then we we substitute to calculate for the tortuosity. There's a factor of two that's added in for symmetry. Again, that's that's just mentioned in this paper here. Um, so I'm, I'm just taking that directly um, from the paper. Uh, but that R1 is this X1. So the circuit fit is allowing us to calculate that tortuosity. So we'll do that um, calculation really quickly as the last exercise here. Clipboard, paste them here. You can see that I've just made some assumptions. Of course, as I, as I mentioned, uh, I just sort of assumed that you know, 2320 is a common uh, coin cell size, certain diameter and thickness. Um, I've assumed a, a conductivity for typical solvents. Um, I've just assumed a value of porosity. I mean, honestly, I don't know what those values are, but I think this is hopefully helpful to see how you might quantitatively make these um, kinds of measurements. So if I put the resistance that I calculated in here, you can see I've got my McMullen number being calculated, and then can't see the value here. You get this tortuosity. And so, and again, in this case, um, the exact number is not terribly important, but I've shown you um, how you can quantitatively calculate this tortuosity. In this case, it's a you know I calculated ten, so you might say, oh, that's 
large. Maybe my electrode material is too, you know, hindering diffusion, and that's why my um, performance isn't what I would want it to be. Let's say. So that's just um, that's just one example of how this analysis might play out. All right, folks. I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you have any questions please leave them in the comments section below. Again, this video is based on an advanced EIS webinar developed by my colleague, Dr. Neil Spinner. We create these webinars on a fairly regular basis. So if you're interested in attending any one of these free webinars, check out pineresearch.com to register. We also make posts on YouTube as well as Twitter and LinkedIn about upcoming webinars. So Follow us on your preferred social media platform to learn about upcoming webinars. All right, again, I hope that you enjoyed this video. Please don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see you soon.